Lesson today is obedience in worshiping God alone. Lesson text is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 11. Our golden text here we see is, I am the Lord thy God. Thy shall have no other God before me. Coming from Exodus 20, verses 2 through 3. Before we begin, let's go ahead to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious Master, once again, here we are. Thinking, thanking you for your grace and mercy. Lifting you up, Father, because you said it in your words. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Asking you right now, Father, to just take self out of the way and let the Holy Spirit come in because we know there's a word from you, Lord, and we want to get a clearer understanding. Father, just come on in and have your way because we truly love you, Father. We pray for the sick, the bereaved, and the shed in. We pray for our pastor and his wife. We pray for the new birth missionary family as a whole. Father, keep us and guide us, and most of all, protect us. We pray for every church standing boldly in your name. We pray for all. Lord, have mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, let's do a little background before we get started here. We're going to go out on last week. Brother Gilmore told us in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 25, and his lesson was obedience and respect. He told us about how Moses was about to purify the peoples. This meant getting them physically and spiritually ready to meet God. The peoples were to set themselves apart from sin and even ordinary daily routines in order to dedicate themselves to God. The act of washing and preparing to serve, to meet, to get their minds and heart ready when they met God to worship. We should set aside the cares and the obsession of everyday life. In other words, don't come up here, in here, looking and sounding any kind of way. We still should learn to approach the Lord with respect and godly fear. Amen? Now, our lesson text today is Exodus 20, again, verses 1 through 11. Obedience and worshiping God alone. Our lesson outline here we see is the only God, Exodus 20, 1 through 6. And then we have the second outline is God's name and the Sabbath, Exodus 20, 7 through 11. Our introduction here says, why were the Ten Commandments necessary for God's new nation? At the point of Mount Sinai, God showed his peoples the true function and beauty of his law. The commandment was designed to lead Israel to, life, to a life of practical holiness in them. People could see the nature of God and his plan for how they should live. The command and guideline was intended to direct the community to meet the needs of each individual in a loving and responsible manner. By the, G by the time Jesus came on the scene, however, most of the peoples looked at the law the wrong way. They saw it as a mean to a riches in both the world and the next, this world and the next. And they thought that to obey every law was the way to earn God's protection from foreign invasion and natural disaster. Law, the law keeps, keeping, law keeping became an end in itself, not the mean to fulfill God's ultimate law of love. Amen. Now we here we'll go to our first outline here, the only God. We see that here verses 1 through 6. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shall have no other God before me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image or any 
likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to the, them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the Father on the, upon the children's into the third and fourth generation of them that hated me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keeps my commandments. Amen. You see, the Israelites had just come from Egypt, a land of many idols and many gods, G-O-D-S, because each god represented a different aspect of life. It was common to worship many gods in order to get the maximum number of blessings. It has been stated that the ancient Egyptians worshipped over 1,400 different gods and goddesses in their shrine, temples, and homes. These deities was the center of a religious lasting over 3,000 years. Can you imagine trying to keep all these gods in order just to get a blessing? So when God told his peoples to worship and believe in him, that wasn't so hard for them. He was just one more God to add to the list. I see them now. Okay, we can do that. Number 1401. But here's the, str the, str the stinger, folks. God pulled it all. God said in verse 3, he said, Thy shall have no other gods before me. Wait a minute. It said pull the brakes. What did he say? Again, we read verses 3. It says, Thy shall have no other God before me. For we see now that was a difficult for the peoples to accept. But if they didn't learn that the God who led them out of Egypt was the only true God, they could not be his peoples. Amen? No matter how faithful they kept the other nine commandments, Thus God made this his first commandment and emphasized it more than the others. God was communicating in them, to them that he simply cannot be adequately represented by anything man can see. Amen? We look here, we see that you shall have no other God before me. God rooted the law in his relationship with the peoples when he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of the slavery. The first commandment begins where we would accept in the area of our relationship to God. God demands our exclusive and zealous worship. He wors to worship God, but Yahweh is to break this commandment, to, break, to worship any other God. But why, yea, it is to break his commandment. All righty. When we look daily here, and as I said earlier today, I was talking about sometimes some, I have some friends that they must read their horoscope before they can start their day. And as I said, I'm a Libra, and I look at, when, the, when you look at the horoscopes and all, you'll see Everyone has the same horoscope in some way, has the same thing going, but God takes us one by one. He, through our daily carols, one by one. We do it, uh, and as I say, we do it where whenever we give some, when we do not acknowledge him when we do take some person or something, the first per place, in our affection or our hopes. The place belongs, the place belongs to God alone. People break this, this commandment whenever they assume the right to demand, to determine their own moral standards. This is to substitute themselves for God. Do you seek to see anything in life from God's point of view as he reveals in the Bible? That is what it means to obey this commandment. It also means we remember that we are stewards responsible to God. 
for all the money, time, and talent he entrusts to us. The first commandment calls us to put God first in our thoughts, first in our relationship, first in our words, first in our leisure time and recreation, first in every part of our lives. God wants to be a part of everything that we're doing, most definitely, but not sin. Keep that in mind. He is a holy God. Amen? The second commandment here worships God's rightly. You say, here he say, you shall have not have, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water below. Although some Christians link this commandment with the first, these verses have a different focus. The first commandment deals with the object of our worship. It forbids the worship of any false gods. The second commandment deals with the manner of our worship. It forbids us to worship even the, it forbids us to worship even the Truman God by image or in a unworthy manner. The second commandment demands our spiritual worship. Amen? Amen. All righty, let's continue here. God considers how we worship him important. The command, the variety of the image we are to exclude from our worship. Anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water below, it includes curses for those who break it and blessings for those who keep it. For I am the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, pushing the children's for, punishing the children's for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to the thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. None of the others commandments list things, list what will happen to a person who break it. Why is this commandment so serious? There are at least two answers to this question. Image dishonor God. Image masks God's glory and dishonor him. This is not what image worships think. The, uh, they often think that the image represents some very valuable aspects of God's glory, but nothing in all creation can ever adequately represent the glory, the majesty, and the incomparable God. Therefore, images always lessen or cheapen the glory of God. That is why God described himself as a jealous God in that command. God jealousy referred to his sign to maintain his glory. Whenever people put, use image to represent God, we dishonor him and insult his glory. The Bible asks, what, with whom then will you compare God? No one, no one. No thing, no one, nobody. To what image will you liken him? The question does not accept an answer, only silence. There is nothing in our creation to which God may adequately be compared. Amen? Images mislead men. Image also mislead peoples. They also mislead peoples. They not only are inadequate, they are harmful. When Aaron made the golden calf, he may have thought that he expressed God's great power visually, but a calf, even one of the great bull cat uh, gods of Egypt, could never, never represent God's true faith. Amen. True worship. God forbid us to worship him by all, by all unworthy means. Do you take the greatest care to worship God rightly? If we are to worship God in the spirit and truth, we must study the scriptures regularly to discover God's true character. How diligently to, do you study to discern God's greatness, experience, expressions, and his mighty attributes? Are you content with inadequate, even cheap 
things about him, wrong idea of God. We must worship him in truth and faith. Amen. Now, our second outline here states that uh, God's name and the Sabbath. I'm going to ha- do this here. Thy shall not take the name of the Lord God, thy, the, of the Lord thy God, in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. God's name is special because it carries his personal identity. Using it of little weight of importance or in a curse is so common these days. You can just hear it. You hear it in songs. You hear it. You see it on shirts. You see it everywhere. But we have to remember that we may fail to realize how serious it is. The way we use God's name conveys how we really feel about him. Do you love him? Do you love him? And if you love him, you're going to use his name, not in vain. Amen? Jesus gave the positive side of the third commandment in the opening sentence of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The name of God represents the nature of God. Hallowed means to set apart as holy. So to misuse the name is to dishonor God. To hollow, the na- to hollow the name is the honor of God. Yahweh, Jehovah, is the great personal name of God reveals at the burning bush. It proclaimed that God is self-existent, eternal, and self-sufficient because God is trial. All the names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are names of God and represent his many perish praise for the attributes we hollow his name when we honor him for these characters in our world words and action we honor god when we understand what these great names signify and let him do these tasks in and for us how might you use god's name to praise him hallowed be thy name thank you lord jesus it is, it, in his speaking, it in praises of worship rather than in curse or jokingly or mockery remarks. We should not take lightly the abuse or dishonor of his name. Amen? Starting with verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thy labor and do all the work. But the Sabbath day is the, the but the day is the sa- of the is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thy shall not do any work, thy thy, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger, and that is within thy gates. Verse eleven. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Sabbath was a day set aside to rest and worship. God commanded a Sabbath because humans human beings need to spend unholy time in worship and rest each week. God explained in these verses that he made the world and everything in it, including us, and rested the seventh day. The, the seventh day. God did not need to rest, but he knows that man needs to rest and that the seventh day is just the right cycle for this. Our resting the seventh day also had a certain import of reminding us that God is our creator and no one else. We owe him our loyalty, worship, obedience, and thanks. We were made by him and for him. We we are responsible to obey him. Apart from his grace, we have no hope of forgiveness or eternal life. Amen? A God who is concerned enough to provide a day 
each week for us to rest is indeed wonderful. Amen? To observe a regular time of rest and worship in our fast-paced world demonstrates how important God is to us, and it gives us the extra benefit of refreshing our spirit. Don't neglect God's provision. And as I stated earlier to the, to the group here, I said to myself, this is a wonderful thing because the way of the world, six days we're out there. We're doing whatever, whenever, and however. And it's so wonderful to come in here refreshing, to hear the word, to hear the preacher say the words. It's so refreshing. To, it's like, as I say, when we get low in gas, we go, we pull in and we fill up, you know. It's a wonderful thing to know whatever is going on in my world, in your world, God is able and he can handle it. And thank God he gives us a moment to come in, take advantage of this, and rejoice instead of seeing it as a chore that Sunday morning I'm going to church and this has got, you know, whatever, you know. It's a joy to come in here and praise the Lord and just give him all the glory, most definitely. And never take that for advantage. Never, never take it for disadvantage. Including, in conclusion, the basis for everything God does in relation to mankind is the fact that he is the creator and therefore has the absolute to give commandments, make judgments, and make uh, covenants, Israel. And we see Israel covenant responsibilities included, keeping God's commandment. Why? Because I am God and I am God all by myself. I made you, I made everything, and I, he has the rights. The, the possession of God's law was central in making Israel a distinct nation. There was also nothing, no, there was also another purpose in the law. Paul wrote in Galatians 3, 9, verses 19 through 25, that the law was a tutor to lead peoples to Christ by revealing sin. The commandments revealed the perfect standards of a holy God. The mission is able to compare human behaviors with the holy standards. Sin is therefore exposed, providing a basic for the personal conviction of sin and the recognition of the need of God intervention by means of a savior, Jesus Christ. For you know, and I know, he's Jesus Christ. He took our sins on an old rugged cross and he died. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. He stayed there several nights, for we know he had some business to take care of. But we know the story. He got up with all power and he lives forevermore. He went home back to his father and he's sitting now on the right hand, interceding for you and I. What a mighty God we serve. He's, and in here it says, it's easy to see from our study that our God is like no other. He keeps his promises and he has given us holy rules to follow for our own good. We would do well to obey it, his rules, and remain faithful to the covenant. We know that he's always keeps his covenant with us. Amen. This is our lesson today. We thank you for listening. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank you.